My name is Larry I. Mello. I'm the uh, president of the Boston University Consortium Council, and I'd like to welcome you all here. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm honored to be, as the chairman of this Consortium Council, to welcome you all for the celebration of our 30th year of continuous collaboration. Um, we have member school districts and very special programs um, in our independent cluster. Uh, as we move through the program tonight, you'll le learn a little bit more about exactly what we do. And um, actually, I've been a member of this for almost 30 years, not 30 continuously, but I would probably say 25. Um, I remember when we used to meet in a class, in a, in a living room of someone's house in Somerville. <laughs> um, briefly, um, the consortium represents an exchange of resources between the cluster members, which would be various school systems and um, some agencies, and, uh, and Boston University School of Education. Um, it offers exceptional opportunities for School of Education students in terms of getting field experiences in schools and in the agencies as well. And having gone through this program myself, um, I remember, God, what was I, 20, 20 21? <laughs> uh, part of what I had to do was, was work in an agency, and the other part was work in a school. And I, I didn't know about the agency part. What do I have to do there? But it was, it was a very good experience for me, and obviously I'm at the end of my career. And, here I am. Um, I'm still here. Uh, uh, since 1977, it's safe to say, I would say about 9,000 students have benefited from these opportunities. Um, in return, uh, the BU School of Education has invested over $1.5 million in funds uh, to support projects uh, in the, all, of, all of the clusters. And all these projects have been proposed by teachers within the clusters. Um, the variety has been exceptional. Uh, and we're, we will have an opportunity to learn uh, very shortly about a few of the projects that have been sponsored in the last year or so. Um, in addition, for more than 10 years, each cluster has received two, full two course scholarships for use anywhere in the university. Um, the key to success in the program is that the responsibility for its policies and the decisions about the allocations of the funds are shared by the members of the consortium from the clusters and the faculty and um, the agencies. And the one central uh, goal, if you will, or about in terms of uh, who we allocate or how much we allocate to who is what is best for the kids, what's best for the students. Um, evidence that all, that all of us consider the act, an activity worthy uh, is documented by the loyalty of all the parties uh, and their consortium council representatives. Um, in the lobby, by the way, we, there's a large poster, you may have seen it on your way in, um, and, uh, of uh, one of our first meetings, and I, think, I believe it was in 1977, and you might want to take a look at it when you go out there, you might recognize some people, or maybe not. <laughs> uh, my, I think we're going to start today um, by... Uh, having a few people come up and discuss uh, one of the projects that we funded from each cluster. So um, it'll give you an idea of some of the, what we've done with some of the funds. Um, so I'm going to call, and I also have a citation uh, for each person that I call up uh, in recognition of what they've done in, uh, in their clusters. So we're going to start with Boston first. And that would be Mr. Antonio Barbosa. And one of you a little chat. Good afternoon. As he said, my name is Tony Barbosa. I'm the principal of the Woodship School, uh, which is located right down the street in Brighton Center. It's a K zero to grade five school. And um, I wanted to recognize some of the people in the audience. Uh, Dr. Muriel Lana, I don't know if she's coming actually is the deputy superintendent for Boston. And uh, Nancy Samarowski, I don't know if she's here as well. Dr. Leonard just came in over there. Uh, she's a great supporter of our value partnerships. And uh, so is Nancy Samarowski, assistant superintendent. 
And I also want to recognize some of my colleagues, Jerry Ford, uh, principal of the uh, RS Men's School, K-12. to And I uh, also want to recognize some of Boston's finest from the Winship School, teachers Lisa Llorente and Tina Papadatos. Um, it is a great pleasure that I say a few words about the value of EU's consortium to our schools. First, the students' interns we get from BU, simply put, they add to the diverse fabric of our staffs, of our students and families. They bring that enthusiasm for continuous learning, while at the same time they delight themselves with excitement in sharing some of their own learning acquired in their first years of preparation for the most rewarding career in this world. Secondly, I want to thank the consortium for their innovative ways and specifically <clears throat> for their funding, enabling staff to carry out special projects, whether it be a single individual or a small group of individuals. Uh, other activities that benefit the general welfare of the whole school community. And yet, other projects, such as at Winship, where the funding helps support the school's <coughs> efforts and shift to a real focus on science education and science learning. <coughs> Most recently, the funding received from the consortium has enabled us to purchase materials to add to each of our classrooms exploration centers, such as books and instruments to support the science curriculum, and to conduct experiments. This funding has also enabled us to purchase non-fiction, science-based guided reading materials to integrate the science within the literacy <coughs> part and into other subject areas throughout the school day. I could go on and on and list many of the areas where we could use this additional funding. As you are probably already men making a mental image yourselves of where you could use it as well. But for now, I just wanted to close by saying once again, thank you to Joan D. and the board for the opportunity we've had over the last 30 years and to request that they continue to strengthen our partnerships. Thank you very much. Cluster, we have a new Shiv Dasani. Well, a week ago, I was given, I received an email saying, uh, the consortium needs uh, a person who is a recipient of hand grants to come and talk at a consortium meeting, and um, I was there because. Uh, I received the most uh, grants from Paddock in uh, the Brookline District, so I'm here with my colleagues, uh, Martha McDonald and Marie Lavelle. And I was supposed to make a presentation board for them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, I received about, uh, you're only allowed to apply once every three years as a teacher, but I help other teachers write grants, and uh, based on the money we received, <coughs> six different grants over three years, uh, we've set up at Lawrence a math resource center, which uh, right now, because besides TADIF funding, we have Brooklyn Education Foundation funding, uh, PDO funding, private donations, and I will be delicious for whatever money I can get. You know, there's not much money in schools. Uh, we have about 600 math board games, uh, computer software, math manipulatives, math movies, math books, math software, and it functions as an uh, elementary school library. So parents and teachers come and borrow stuff from us. Everything's cataloged. Uh, they can take it out for a week at a time. And the items are also loaned into districts to different schools. Um, math specialists and teachers borrow from that. And uh, we're in our sixth year of operation now, and we have $10,000 worth of materials. And um, the latest 
uh, TADF fund went towards getting um, 250 pedometers that look like this with uh, a step into math logo designed by the grandmother of one of the kids in our school. And it involves parents, teachers, and students. And over here, we have step into math, no guts, no glory. So use your pedometers. Uh, we had a fourth grade class that wore the pedometers all day and then graphed the data. And something else they found out, which is very interesting, was um, some kids, they were walking and they were using this, and halfway through the day, it got reset. And the results were very low. So that was a neat lesson to learn that, you know, data collection isn't easy, sometimes it's wrong, and they were like, well, it says 2,000 steps, but I really walk 6,000, so should I put down 6,000 steps? And at that point, they were told, no, you have to put down accurate data, whatever you collected, and that's what gets put down. And so they were kind of disappointed that they were so low when he was one of the most active kids in the classroom. <laughs> but, you know, next time around, they want a kid do the project all over again. They're excited about this. Uh, the pedometers convert, uh, uh, measure steps, and they convert it to miles. So it's a great fourth grade lesson, and we have these pedometers. One of the teachers coming over with me told me that she'd love to borrow it, and I organize them in boxes of 25 <coughs> each, so it's a class set, and they get loaned out to different schools. So um, I'd like to thank Tata, Tata for uh, funding this. And also, for the first year last year, I qualified to get DU students. And I had two pre-practicum students come to me, uh, Susan Gilmore and Joanna Mueller, and they were absolutely wonderful. Smart, uh, punctual, uh, you know, they knew how to handle kids, and they loved doing the math lessons at Lawrence, because we uh, use a lot of technology and gizmos to teach math, and the kids love it. So thank you very much. <laughs> Chelsea, we have Joseph Mackey. Okay. I didn't know that it was going to be quite this formal. Thank you. Uh, anyway, I would I would like to just speak to the fact that this is also the twentieth year that the Chelsea Public Schools has, in fact, been associated with Boston University through that rather unique partnership that we all know about. <coughs> and uh, at the end of the year, when the fiscal year turns, Boston University will no longer be managing the Chelsea Public Schools. So some of the good things that have come out of the consortium directly relate to the things that we will be doing in the future. And the partnership <coughs> has been very fruitful, very positive. We have student teachers now that are in my school on a regular basis. Mrs. Foley, the lead teacher for the social sciences, has prevailed upon the persons at the School of Education to increase that uh, participation, which is wonderful. And uh, we actually are working toward revamping several schools over the last several years. When I first came to Chelsea, the middle school was a 7-8 building with 1,400 children. And now we have three distinct middle schools, which are five, six, seven, and eight, of approximately 500, 550 students in each of them, which as, without digressing too greatly, is educationally more sound. We have the kids for four years rather than a stopover for two years before we move them on to the high school. So I'll give you a brief uh, idea of what we put forward last year for proposals, and that's what were funded, and then I'll speak to the larger one that I chose to speak about. So literally, last year, the consortium funded the Harvard Model Congress, and then it was a read-at-home library at the Sokolowski Elementary School, which was a wonderful gift to the school. And then there was a character education program at the John Silver Early Learning Center, centered on the theme of I can, I am, and I will. And then there was a band trip to the Heritage Foundation in New York City with Chelsea High School participants and an after school extension yearbook program at the Wright Middle School where I am the assistant principal and literally what that was was that it funded two teachers to teach 
computer processes to kids in five, six, seven, and eight. They took the pictures, they designed the yearbook, they cut out the middleman, so we were able to actually publish a 40 to 45 page full color yearbook for the first time at less than five dollars <coughs> per kid because we didn't need to go to the publisher and pay the exorbitant prices for layout and so forth because our kids learned to do <coughs> layout and design on site and so we could literally cut the process to, down to a third of what would have been the actual cost. Uh, and then, you know, there was an exchange trip to New York City with the, the three participating schools, the Wright, the Brown, and the Clark Avenue Middle School. We also had grants asked for funding for the Model UN, and if that had come to pass, they would have gone to the, model, to the United Nations, they would have met with a specific ambassador, and then they would have taken a day trip to Ellis Island. And then there was also a funding for the Blue Man Group. Funding being very tight, literally we had to make choices, and so they weren't funded, but they were worthwhile creative projects. The Harvard Model Congress, which took place at Chelsea High School, uh, was a part of developing civic pride and understanding of the fundamental processes of government and other participatory democ democratic uh, proposals and understanding set forth in a four-day meeting at Harvard University. So the consortium funded 25 kids and three adults to go and spend time with kids from all over the United States and in some cases from around the world and they stayed at Harvard for four days, learned the participatory process, understood how to debate pro and con, all of those neat things that you want kids to walk out of high school with confidence and the ability to do. And it represented a diverse number of kids within Chelsea High School. One of which is a young man who when he entered the high school wasn't quite ready to be in high school managed to uh, have to repeat the ninth grade because he wasn't mature enough. And maturity, as we know, sneaks up on us whether we wanted it or not. <laughs> and by the time he had effectively hit the, the 11th grade, he figured out, you know, I'm actually good at speaking, and I can rally kids to do things that need to be done in the school. And he's now a student government representative. And out of that process, he literally focused and honed his debating skills and we had him in last week for uh, you know getting the kids ready to go to high school in the eighth grade. So he came down as the student model representative to speak to the kids and say, okay, now when I was in the ninth grade, no, I didn't want to go either. And you have to understand five years hence, this is where you'll be. And with that, he made the announcement that he is running for election as the district council representative from Chelsea in the sixth district. And uh, judging from the way the kids responded to him and what I heard in the neighborhood. I think we have an 18, 19 year old who will be a city councilor in June. And uh, it's really, he, he literally looked at the kids and said, the positives that have come forward from the extracurricular, i.e. the Harvard Model Congress, have honed his focus on where does he want to be and where does he want to go. And that is a tell of good, you know, and, and, and that's an important thing to note. And that's when the kid went, oh, Okay, so they're not just giving us the drivel, there's a reality model here, and they understood him. And this is a street tough kid who has made the 180 degree transition, and I think he could out talk any five people I know, but that's, that will stand him well in politics. So I fully believe he will, in fact, be elected. So if there's anybody sitting in the audience that are the funding mechanisms and the ones that we should prevail upon and cajole and entice or whatever other adjective you'd like to use, I only say to you that if you could increase the funding, it is worthwhile. I have young, excited staff that given the opportunity and those little pieces of extra money, it can make a world of difference. And I will put this in perspective so you'll understand. Uh, you're, talk, you're looking at someone who's one of 16 children, and education has been the catalyst for my success in life. And uh, I assure you, I'm not the most successful one of the 13 boys and three girls in my family. But my father expected us to finish high school and go on to college. And education is the key that can make or break a kid. So what we do here is critically and utterly important. And I thank you for the things that you have done, and I thank you for your continued support.
Concord Cluster, uh, Bev Gauthier. Hi. Um, for the past 30 years that the Alcott School in Concord has been associated with the consortium, it's been a really wonderful collaboration, I think, for both of us. Um, as long as I can remember, every Wednesday a bus pulls up from BU and the students flood off of the bus and into the schools and into the classrooms, all very excited to be there. And um, the teachers are delighted to have them come and to mentor them a little bit and to get a little extra help in the classroom. And the students love to have the um, college students come in. And they always miss them very much when they leave. So that's been a wonderful part of our collaboration. Also, we're very grateful for the funding that we've had. Um, we've been using the funding most recently for um, work with our writing program. And we've been able, um, through the funds, um, that has really helped us to be able to have people come from Teachers College in Columbia to help us to learn the Lucy Calkins writing method. A few of us went to hear Lucy Calkins speak a few years ago and got very excited listening to her and um, wanted to sort of bring that method into our school. So we've been able to fund summer institutes that have been very well attended, where the teachers not only have learned how to teach writing, but how to write themselves, which has been really important. When they've had to walk the walk, it's easier to talk the talk. And um, we've had also training during the year. We've had a, a, um, a K-2 trainer who's come in and has worked with teachers during the year in the classrooms, coaching them in the classrooms, meeting with them before and after to talk about what they're doing. We've also had another coach who's been um, for the third through fifth grade um, who has done the same kind of thing, meeting in the classroom and uh, meeting with the teachers after school. And they've been very available to us. We get emails all the time. They send us um, all kinds of materials that we can use. So we feel that we've been very enriched by um, this experience. And we are definitely seeing an improvement in our students' writing, especially their narrative writing at this point. So very grateful and thank you very much. And the Independent Educational Institutions, Tom Krasinski. Good evening, folks. Good evening. Um, I work with really little people <laughs> And um, I'm thinking that uh, it's very touching to hear all the good news about education and all the things, the creative programs that are happening because of BU and the consortium, instead of all the bad news about people being shot and stuff like that that you see on television. So I wish <coughs> this was on television, and the other stuff would be put in the closet. Um, so I, I teach dance at the uh, Clinton Path Preschool, and that's where this funding comes from the consortium that helps me uh, put my kid to BU. <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> For me, dance is really a springboard into teaching kinesthetic creativity. So I am not interested in turning out really short dancers. What I'm really interested in doing is have them be aware of movement, stillness, and body awareness, how that triggers uh, creativity quite organically. Um, my approach is to facilitate children's desire to learn to play, and to be joyful. So um, that the school experience from the very beginning is really a cool thing. That they want to be there. They want to come to school. And I do that by three E's. I engage them, I excite them, and I try to expand their worldview. So uh, my little bullet point, my wife said, she works in the business, she says, how do you, how do you engage them? And I said, when I go to turn on the music, I tell them to, to push the button on my chin. So when they push the button, the CD player goes on. How I excite them into learning is that I really facilitate the class rather than direct the class. So I watch what they do, and I see a good kinesthetic moment. And I'll say, Zoe, look what Zoe, Zoe, can you show that again? So the kids really take ownership of the class, 
and they all feel like what they do can be acknowledged as something special. Uh, the expand the world view is say, oh, Zoe, that was really cool. Now, you know, sometimes when I think about this, I add this to it. And I expand their world view about how to move kinesthetically. Um, so in this uh, kind of kinesthetic world that is created, I, there are little arenas that happen. And it is a delight to actually think about them and plan what I was going to say. Because usually I don't. Things are happening so quick. And it's like their attention spans, if anyone teaches really small kids, you know, if you get a four-minute run, that's pretty good. <laughs> so there's problem solving. Some of the things that I do in the dance world is problem solving. And for instance, I'll do a game. I will make a shape with my body, or someone will make a shape, and I will say, is this an over, under, around, or through? And then each kid has to make a choice how they want to do it. Um, there's building a movement language of, invent of imagination. And I had an autistic boy in one of my classes at the Brookline Music School who the parent kept saying, how's he doing? How's he doing? I'm saying, it's like totally great. I find that he's an individual learning plan. He's a total basket case sitting down and trying to get it. He comes up with this movement. He says, oh, Tom, this is the movement I like to show you. I said, so what's that? He says, that's called peeking through the window. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that language, instead of arabesque or padishah, you actually make a language, you watch what the kids do, and then we label it. OK, what's the name for this? Um, then there's the concept of non-ownership, which is basically I define space by either objects or tape, but people can get very possessive and say, this is my piece of tape. This is my shape. And I try to dissolve that atmosphere of ownership so that there's, it's a little bit more fluid and things just move. You get what you get and you don't get upset. Lots of luck on that one. <laughs> <laughs> then there is uh, uh, cause and effect. <clears throat> slipping is usually followed by falling. <laughs> so if you're slipping, so really getting them to touch the world about what happens. If this is happening over and over again, this is probably what's going to follow. And some of them really get it. Um, interpersonal dynamics. So if anyone has ever tried to hold hands in a circle with a bunch of kids, usually people are yanking each other. So I talk about sensitivity and being sensitive to each other and paying attention to each other. And for them to expand their world into other is a really great thing. And the last thing, which is kind of exciting for me, I got a grant from uh, the Brookline Public Schools to bring mathematics and dance together. So far, I've taught it through K's and 1's and the 6th grade. And now I'm starting to integrate it into the nursery school so that pattern recognition, number recognition, shape recognition, symmetry, asymmetry, positive, all these things, they're just getting. So this is what the grant is helping the, how the, it's helping the school. and I just want to take a moment to um, thank the consortium for its assistance. But before I do so, I just want to recognize a few people who are here um, in the audience for their support themselves. Um, Dr. Jeff Young, who is our superintendent. Ms. Viv Zavoda, who is the principal at Lincoln Elliott School. Dr. John Michael Gray, our fine um, arts coordinator. Uh, Ms. Diane Lockhead, and Dr. Bert Weiner from Newton North High School. Um, with the support of the consortium, we're able to purchase some curriculum for a population who historically have not been served in most public schools. 
Um, we developed a program called Community Connections, which serves students who are ages 18 to 22 years old. They are in the special education um, department in the schools and have significant and multiple disabilities. Um, and I have to say, fortunately, they've been included in the general education curriculum for kindergarten through 12th grade in the new public schools. But after 12th grade, when they walk in graduation for the experience, um, they don't receive a diploma um, because they have not passed the MCAS. All of their peers then move out into college um, and into their own futures. And these students are left behind and need to then focus on their own transition into adulthood, um, which is quite difficult, and to understand what life will be like without the support of the public school system. So with the curriculum that we uh, purchased from the consortium, we were able to uh, create a dynamic program that was quite comprehensive for this population of students and help them plan for their futures. Um, I want to just talk about one student in particular who has particularly benefited from um, participation in the program. With the curriculum that we purchased, he was able to um, research um, what jobs might be open to him, develop a resume, apply for a job, practice his interview skills, and he has now secured a position. He is working part-time at Harvard Business School. He is responsible for <coughs> compiling all of the packets that are used during the Harvard presentations that happen, um, pamphlets and so forth. He has a fabulous uh, retirement plan. He is paid and has a great 401k plan. He has a good plan now for his future. Um, the other thing we're able to do is help him learn to travel train from his home in Newton into Cambridge independently. This is life changing for him and for his parents. Um, so he's going to be able to uh, move on and have a good future for himself. Um, so I really appreciate this recognition. It means a lot, especially to recognize this population of students who often are invisible in our society. So I give you my sincerest thank you. I'm representing um, Somerville Public Schools, Somerville High School specifically, and um, <clears throat> I am now the uh, department head for math and science at Somerville High School after having done four years as the K-12 math curriculum coordinator. Um, <clears throat> the One of the things I can speak about, well, gosh, for I can't tell you how many years we've been lucky to be funded for many projects from BU, um, but the most recent ones, um, there are a couple that come to mind, and the first one would be, <coughs> excuse me, uh, one of my AP teachers, she actually teaches AP computer science, A and B. Uh, apparently the college board all of a sudden decided to change some, uh, some things in the language, in Java, uh, without getting too specific. Um, and she needed the training, because we expect as many kids, as, uh, we expect most of the kids who take an AP course to take the test, and we're looking for the scores. Well, she had a, um, so she had gone in the summertime for this project uh, to learn all the nuances of, of the, the language, and she's implementing it this year. And last year, she had a 75% participation rate, and, and the 75% of the kids that took the test, uh, we got all, all of them got fours and fives. So we are now looking that she's she's gone to the training. Of course, we're looking for more fives, <laughs> and we're looking for a bigger participation rate as well. Um, I also had a um, physiology teacher uh, request uh, fetal pigs and sheep's brains and um, all those kinds of good things. Uh, um, <laughs> Well, anyway, uh, she just told me, I asked her to write me a little paragraph today, and of course I left it in a pocket somewhere, but uh, I remember what she said. Um, she, they were dissecting a pig, and, which is one of the items that we got from the EU, and uh, <laughs> few of them, there, there are about 10 of them, and, uh, and I happened to be there, I did, my, I did her observation report while she was doing the... Uh, uh, the dissection, and um, these were the kids in physiology are mostly nursing students, and this is going to sound like a strange mix, but nursing students and cosmetology students, and uh, very interesting. And uh, they were totally engaged. She got a good value, a good observation report, needless to say. But the kid, one of the kids, went to Bunker Hill and came back to talk to her, and she said, 
there was a young lady, and she said, I was the only one in my class at Bunker Hill that had dissected anything before. So she was able to help the, kid, help the rest of the kids in her class at Bunker Hill from what you has given to us for her and her classes. So I could go on and on, but I'm not uh, with that. And we've, we've done very well by DU for the last 25 years anyway. Um, well, we're going to head to a different part of the program today. And um, needless to say, we're grateful, for the, grateful to the, for the support from the clusters. And there are two people that I haven't recognized yet that I need to. And it would be Joanne Richard and Deb Folzoy. Falzoy, sorry. Uh, they've been very helpful to us um, and, and, and grateful to the dean's host as well and our media staff. Um, so we're now going to head into, I'd like to introduce Dr. Me. Dr. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Glenn. And I guess. Thanks, Larry. Thank you. Thank you. We raised the schedule a little bit, as you can see. It's a real pleasure for me because during the 21 years when I worked in Massachusetts government, one of my responsibilities was the METCO program. So I worked with each one of the districts that's represented in the consortium, of course, very closely over the years. Although my main involvement was, of course, with the urban districts. Uh, I think, speaking of 30 years, I may be the only person alive who had children in the Boston Public Schools for 30 years straight without interruption. <laughs> All seven of my children started out at the Boston Elementary Schools. The first two, the oldest two, at the William Monroe Trotter, which is a school that we're now paired with, and the other five at the Rafa Hernandez. So uh, it's, it's a wonderful pleasure for me that we're again working so closely with Boston as well as with Chelsea. Uh, I sent uh, this afternoon 60 of my undergraduate students over to Chelsea to visit the high school at the Kelly Elementary School as they do every Thursday. And we're wonderfully grateful for what that kind of experience of being in schools means to our students preparing to teach. They just long for it. And they're so uh, energized by the opportunity to be out and see wonderful teachers. We're hoping this spring we'll be able to do that perhaps with some of the Boston schools as well. That said, it's uh, also an exciting moment for us that, that Boston uh, is, is able to look forward to, I hope, a period of, of a wonderful growth and achievement for its pupils with the new superintendent, Carol Johnson, who it's my honor to introduce now. She comes having, uh, having been a great success elsewhere, and therefore the expectations upon her are extraordinarily <laughs> high. And I'm going to raise them even higher because I think that uh, I think we need Boston and the Boston Public Schools to be uh, the finest urban school system in the United States. And I'm confident that she can take us there. So. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I'm really delighted to be here and delighted to be asked to uh, speak to you today. And I have to say that um, the presentations that you've already heard have been very inspiring and a really true testament to the great partnerships that have existed between Boston University and many of the school districts <coughs> in this community. I want to especially uh, acknowledge that uh, President uh, Bob Brown was on the search committee, so is in part responsible for my presence here. And uh, certainly uh, Dean Glenn and um, the Consortium Council Chairperson um, Larry Iamello, as well as uh, I'd like to acknowledge Associate Dean uh, D, uh, whose husband is, uh, made sure that I didn't get too lost as I tried to traverse from the parking lot <laughs> into this building. So thank you so much for welcoming me here. I was trying to uh, think about 30 years and imagine um, where we were in public education some 30 years ago. And I tried to uh, think about it, and for some of you who were around then, and just in looking at the audience, I recognize that some of you were, 
Others, <laughs> others may be not so. Um, but we really didn't have um, iPods and all the technology that exists, and uh, cell phones maybe that were so ubiquitous as they are today. Um, we didn't really serve breakfast in most of our schools uh, as we do today. We did serve lunch and um, maybe not to as many students as we do today. We um, certainly, I think all the districts represented here, have become more diverse in language, more diverse in income, and uh, more diverse in uh, racial and cultural groups. Um, the boundaries that we thought about 30 years ago certainly uh, were statewide and maybe some nationally, but I'm not sure that we recognize the international challenge or the global community that our children would inherit at uh, 30 years ago. And we knew that students needed a good start in kindergarten, but we really hadn't embarked on the important work of trying to figure out four-year-olds and how to give students a good and early start before kindergarten so that they did develop the early language skills that would be necessary. But today, I think that all of those things, uh, and maybe 30 years ago, the people who conceptualized this consortium understood maybe more than most that unless the higher ed reached out to its partners in K-12, not just in terms of recruiting students and offering scholarships, which Boston University has so graciously and generously done, but also in thinking about how these early investments could pay off huge dividends in terms of the quality of teaching and the wonderful experiences that we want not just students to have, but teachers to enjoy. And I think that whether you heard people talk about fitness and science programs, or whether you heard them talking about dance and kinesthetic creativity, or whether you heard them talk about uh, the powerful impact and transformational impact that students who have special needs can enjoy when uh, there are other opportunities extended to them. I'm sure that um, these are just small examples of the powerful impact 30 years of partnership through the consortium uh, has created. And so um, on behalf of especially the Boston Public Schools and the Boston School com community, I certainly want to thank and acknowledge the generous work that has been done. And I want to especially say just a word about uh, the Trier Elementary School and the English High School, uh, two of the schools that have been selected from our superintendent schools, schools that are working aggressively to change the tide of learning for so many students. And uh, Boston University has agreed, in partnership with Mayor Moneo, to really focus on those two schools and to do everything possible to um, give those students and those teachers opportunities to turn those schools around and make them the kind of uh, star-like schools that we would want um, for all of our children. I am still learning. I have been here seven weeks, even though um, I know it may seem like longer to some of you, uh, <laughs> sometimes to me. But, um, <laughs> In that uh, very short set of seven weeks, um, I think that I have learned um, a few things. And so um, let me just say a little bit about that. Um, I think that um, we are truly planting seeds for a garden that takes a little bit longer to grow than just one year of making AYP. And so for all of us, it's important for us to keep in mind that this is a journey not just a one-year partnership. And I know that Boston University recognizes that more than most and understands that the partnership does start early. The other uh, learning that I think that um, I have had over the last uh, few weeks is that we really can't do it alone. And so those of us who work in K-12 do need the active participation and partnership of the higher education community as well as the higher education community needs us to do our jobs well and better so that you have the kind of students who can uh, gain easy admittance to your school, but also who uh, can complete college and go on to make valuable contributions uh, to this community. So this partnership piece is critically uh, important to the long-term uh, investments um, that we want.
The other uh, learning, I think, is not thinking that we can wait to high school to begin to talk about college, but understanding that um, college does indeed start uh, with planning early season kindergarten and before, and helping students understand and value the importance of getting a great education. And to me, I was really pleased to hear uh, Tom describe play and the joyful learning, because I think uh, a well-educated person is someone who will be able to not just pass MCAS or be proficient, but who will appreciate the rich arts and music community that exists in the Boston community. Because unless we invest there too, we won't have students who will either appreciate and enjoy the symphony or the pops or be appreciative of the investments that are necessary in the wonderful institutions that are here that promote music. Um, one of my dear friends uh, in Minneapolis is a woman by the name of Sharon Ryan. And Sharon serves on the board of Boston University. And when I first told her that I was coming to Boston, um, you can't imagine how thrilled she was and also how eager she was to tell me about the great leadership and support that I could enjoy <coughs> from uh, Boston University. So I'm going to hold her to that commitment and insist that um, the, um, certainly the university continue to partner with the, with the uh, school districts. And I think that what's important for us to know is wherever our children go to school in this community, whether it uh, is um, in Boston or whether it's in Somerville, or whether it's in Newton or one of the other districts represented today, we as the greater Boston community should uh, care about education and ed educating all of our children wherever their parents uh, choose to send them. I'd like to just end my remarks today um, first just acknowledging and congratulating uh, the principals, teacher leaders, and superintendents who are here today and who work to make this day possible be, through your partnership, because this, even if Boston University wanted to create a great partnership uh, through a grant-making process, it really does require great leadership in schools that are willing to extend themselves to think creatively and differently and, and put in the extra time that is required. But um, as I was leaving Memphis, uh, we had a number of graduations uh, this year. And uh, one of our students who was um, graduating from high school wrote a, a brief essay as he was trying to acquire a scholarship to go on to college. And um, in Memphis, we say every child, every day, college bound, because we believe that every day our children should experience teachers who see them as college bound, whether they choose to go to college or not. That in fact, um, the current economy and the current um, competition will require every one of our students to have some post-secondary experience that will allow them to take care of their families. But college is really an important concept and it's especially an important concept for children who are live in poverty or who are first generation um, as this young man is. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I will read just some excerpts, excerpts from it. And uh, he titles it, why I want to go to college. I want to go to college because I have to succeed. No one in my immediate family has even graduated from high school, let alone attended and graduated from college. I will be a trailblazer in my family, being the first to graduate from high school and going on to graduate from college. Except for one of my aunts, no one in my family has a job. My grandmother and my mother are both living off government aid, and my uncle just doesn't have a job. And they all sit around all day and do nothing. I want to go to college because I'm determined not to make the same mistakes that they've made. I want to go to college because I am driven from, for success by the fear of failure. As a child, I was forced to grow up and mature early there were times when I went out and emptied trash for local businesses just to earn a couple of dollars to buy bread and hot dogs to eat in the house. There were times when I would go out and play all day and there would be nothing to eat at home and I would have to go to bed hungry. 
Sometimes I would go to local stores and get the food that the owner did not sell that day. But most times, that wasn't guaranteed. I even used to steal candy and toys because my family couldn't afford them. Towards the end of my seventh grade year, I was kicked out of my house and had to go live with my grandfather. There I had to stay with an infant that cried nearly every night at two o'clock in the morning. My grandfather had to be at work at five that morning, so I was the person that had to change her diaper and put her back to sleep, even though I too had to go to school the next morning. I want to go to college because I have to succeed. As a child, I've experienced obstacles and experiences that are abnormal. I've already seen a lot of my low points in life, and once you've been to the bottom, there's really nowhere to go but up. I want to go to college because I want to be able to afford the things that I want instead of worrying about where my next meal is coming from. And I know that going to college is a necessary step to becoming prosperous and happy in life. Mm -hmm. The work that we do every day is transformative in the lives of the children we serve. And all of us take that work very seriously, those who work in K-12 as well as those who work in higher ed. And I thank Boston University for understanding how important it is for all of our children to aspire to go to college. Thank you. coaches in English high school so that they can in turn influence the, the kids to apply in their academics the same kind of desire to succeed that they do in their, their sports. Uh, there are others here, here as well. I won't try to call all the names or I'll miss them. Uh, wonderful to have you here. Um, English high school, by the way, is where I vote. And so, uh, I will, and, it, and my daughter plays frisbee every night in the, uh, in the in the athletic field, so I'm counting on John to keep it in the chair. Uh, so it's wonderful to have all of you here. We're going to have an informal reception now. We've had enough formal time. Let's get together and talk out in the lobby. And thank you all for coming. Just one thing. Yes, sorry, Larry. I, I, uh, I missed one person. Oh, I'm so embarrassed. Um, Lexington Public Schools, Vicki Schwartz. Oh, Thank you, Dr. Jackson. Thank you. thank you so much. I wanted to say thank you to the you. You have touched the minds and hearts of my students and me, and I'm about to cry because she was so good. <laughs> I'm just here to tell you how I spend your money. I, I have been fortunate I, to have had 25 BU students over the past several years as my Wednesday students and my third grade students take it very seriously that it's their job to convince those BU students to become teachers. So they, they work very hard to say, see, this is what you really want to do. <laughs> My third graders every year, use, we use BU funds to go to the aquarium with our kindergarten book buddies. And when we do this, my third graders learn how to become teachers themselves. I really believe that a child doesn't really understand something until they can teach it. And so they teach how to read, they teach about how to find out, and we use some of our funds for materials, 
and, and the materials include nonfiction books that our third graders read to and with our kindergartners, and fish for dissection, which our third graders do. And we then, the, the third graders create ocean alphabet books, which they work on and find out things about ocean life and read them and eventually present them to the kindergartners. And it has been such a wonderful learning experience for kindergartners and for third graders. And <coughs> some of my students are now oceanography students in college because of what we started with kindergarten and third grade. So to all of you, thank you so much.